All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is Ben Jones. If it sounds like my voice is a little hoarse and you're thinking about the day to night party, I want to remind you that correlation does not imply causation. <laughs> this session is all about data pitfalls. You know, I uh, had the great fortune to be able to write this book, Communicating Data with Tableau. I'm the technical evangelism director uh, at the company. And, and when I read, wrote that book, I, I learned a lot. Uh, uh, and I made a lot of mistakes. So many mistakes. But it's actually great because when you make that many mistakes, as many as I do with data, you can all put it all in a second book about what not to do. So that's what I've got here, a preview of the ideas going into this next book called Avoiding Data Pitfalls with Wiley. And if you want to chat about this online with your fellow attendees or what have you, you can use the, the hashtag data pitfalls. And uh, if you feel like you can turn this into a confessional like mine if you want, and you can even make up a fake account and such if that makes you feel better. But fact of the matter is we all fall into data pitfalls, don't we? I mean, the software today is amazing, but it's tricky business because data is tricky. It turns out that the trail to the top of Mount Data Olympus is full of pitfalls. And, and it's so, so easy, right, to, to, follow, to find ourselves uh, on these beautiful new peaks of knowledge, right, with amazing views, but also we can find ourselves uh, falling right into these pitfalls using the exact same tools, right? This is a, a photograph I took on a, a hike to a place called Coal Creek Falls near where I live out in Bellevue, Washington. And that guy's looking like he's having a pretty bad day, isn't he? There's actually a sinkhole right there off the side of the trail that they're trying to, to let you know about, which a sinkhole is kind of crazy because you walk, you think, you're, you think you're fine, and then all of a sudden the ground goes away. And I thought, actually, that's kind of uh, just like data sometimes too, right? In fact, I don't even sometimes find out I'm in a pitfall till uh, way on down the road, right? I might even think I'm doing great. And, and lo and behold, I find there's some issues with what I've been doing and what I've been seeing. Um, I love this quote right here uh, by Yogi Berra. He's a Yankee catcher from the 20th century. We made too many of the wrong mistakes. I put this quote in there because I love Yogi Berra quotes, but also uh, because this one kind of tickled me, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, is he saying that there are, like, the right mistakes to make, right? I mean, what are those? I wish I could make some more of those, make some more of the right mistakes. Here's the seven sections of this chapter that we're going to cover today in the next hour. Uh, and these are, um, and we're not going to cover six and seven, actually. We're just going to cover the first five, and that's because I haven't written the chapters yet. So the first one is all about epistemology, how we think about data. The second one is all about some technical traps we can get into and we move data around. The third about is about math, because math's hard. The fourth is, fourth is about trying to do some stats and some things we can get. We're just going to touch on those ones at the end. We don't have a whole lot of time when I go through the first few. And then, you know, analytical aberrations, ways we can, again, you know, uh, conduct analysis in ways that might lead us astray. So that's the point. That's going to be the, the outline of the book that I'm working on. And, um, yeah, it's been a really fun process to write this book and, again, you know, catalog a lot of the mistakes I make and continue to make, by the way. There's even an example from last week in there. So it just goes to show you, you know, writing a book about mistakes doesn't mean you're immune to them. But... Uh, I want to talk about that, too, a little bit toward the end. You know, how do we become more uh, aware or immune? What are some things we can do to help uh, prevent ourselves from falling into some of these pitfalls? Number one, epistemic errors, how we think about data. Well, what is epistemology? The theory of knowledge, especially with regard to its methods, validity, and scope. Another way to think about it is just kind of like investigating what distinguishes justified belief from opinion. Um, and, and really getting to a uh, good understanding of that. So I'll start with a number, 34,513. It's actually the number in the single slide here that will probably include data going back the farthest from this entire conference because this number is the number of meteorites that have been recorded to have fallen since 2500 BC all the way up to when the data uh, was, was last pulled by... Uh, my friend Ramon Martinez uh, back in 2012. And that data is updated now, too. If you wanted to go onto the Meteoritical Society, you would find it. And Ramon is a, a fabulous um, visualization designer. He lives in Washington, D.C., and works at the Pan American Health 
organization, but this number got me thinking. You know, I thought to myself, well, 30, that's, you know, a lot of meteorites have struck the earth since, uh, since way back when. 34,000, okay. I mean, the first question I wanted to know was, you know, where did they land? You know, or where, did they, where, did they, uh, where were they noticed? And so here's a visualization of every, uh, every one, every one of them. All 34,513 dots are right there on the map, which tells us really clearly right away that meteorites are afraid of the water, okay? They do not swim, and so they're not landing there. Somehow, magically, they're landing only on inhabited areas and avoiding the Amazon and the tundra of North Russia. Now, Ramon didn't make the mistake I made because you can even see in his title that he says we're talking about every recorded meteorite. And so if you think about that, well, maybe I would say to myself then, okay, how many actually have there been if 34,000 isn't the correct number because no one happened to be floating in a raft when it went through? I bet you it's a lot larger than 34,000 because 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. There's a lot of completely uninhabited areas still, places I mentioned before. And actually, if you go back and look over time, the records weren't even regularly kept until the latter half of the 20th century, our lifetime. You know, they would mostly have records from, from writings and things like that where they were able to determine there was a meteorite. So the fact of the matter is, you know, we're looking at recorded uh, instances. And that means, yes, there was a meteorite. Someone observed it and either recorded it or told it to someone who did, okay? Uh, I'll tell you another story. I grew up in Southern California. And I remember the early morning of January 17th, 1994, quite vividly. I would have been a sophomore in high school then. And it was 4.31 a.m., a magnitude 6.7 earthquake struck the San Fernando Valley region, about 24 miles from my house. That was enough to rattle my cage good and not enough to do more damage than just pictures falling off the wall and such. But it got me and my whole family up out of bed and onto our front lawn in, in the wee hours of the morning there. Uh, you know, sadly, 60 people died in that earthquake, and then uh, thousands were, dam uh, were injured, and there was widespread damage there in the city. I remember it very vividly. Entire sections of the bridge just gone. And what's amazing is, you know, back then, and even, not, even recently as 94, um, that was before I had an email address uh, or a cell phone. Um, if I wanted to study earthquake uh, instances and data. I wouldn't know where to go. I don't, I'm trying to think back what it would, like, would have been like back then. You know, would I have gone to the Thousand Oaks Library where I lived and gone to the Dewey Decimal System and pulled some, car, some drawers and gone and found a book? Would I have had to travel to some government agency and try to, you know, I, would I have had to write a letter to somebody? It's amazing to think now because, you know, today we can just go to the USGS, United States Geological Survey, has a website with an earthquake catalog of every single earthquake going back to 1900. And you can just click a button and you've got it right there in front of you. It's really remarkable. I, I feel hopeful for my kids that they have this amazing data at their fingertips and these incredible tools like Tableau and other tools to make use of it. Unbelievable. So I took a, uh, that data and downloaded it, you know, and I was thinking about, well, you know, how have earthquakes played out over time on a timeline? Are they on the rise? And this is what I found if I looked for world wide magnitude 6.0 and up from 1900 to 2013. And if you stop and look at that, that's pretty frightening, isn't it? I mean, why isn't every major newspaper in the country saying alarming multi-decade rising trend in earthquake continues? Why aren't we all, you know, walking around with, I don't know, helmets or astronaut suits or something ready for the next one? It's going up and up and up. What the heck? Well, if I take that same timeline and divide it by magnitude, split out the 6.0s with the 7.0s and the 8.0s and the 9.0s, you can see pretty quick what's going on. It's the magnitude 6 and, uh, and up, 6 to 6.9, that light orange line that's accounting for this big rise. The 7s and 8s and 9s actually look pretty flat, don't they? And why is that? Well, it's clearly because our ability to detect earthquakes increased dramatically in the 20th century. 
1961, the Albuquerque Seismological Laboratory is established. Four years later, 111 uh, seismic uh, network stations were installed. 71, first installations of digital seismographs. The technology got better, right? There was even a, a global seismology network in 1984 that was formed. And our ability to detect earthquakes in remote places in smaller and smaller magnitudes went up and up and up. There was never any doubt when a 7.5 happened, you know, we always knew, even without all those. That, that pretty much got everybody's attention even back before all this technology was added. So it's really fascinating for me to think about that. If you stop, you know, what's happening here is that uh, the gap between data and reality is getting smaller, right? All of these marvelous technological advances uh, and, and are ones we should applaud and be thankful for, but at the same time, you know, a, a byproduct of all of that is that it's really difficult for us to go back and discern historical trends in earthquake occurrences over time, isn't it? We don't know. Earthquakes could have been happening more often. For all we know, the trend could be a decreasing one. Because in the 70s, that's not apples to apples with the 60s, is it? Because of our abilities. Another example, every day on my work, my way to work at the Tableau offices from 2013 to 2015, so going back a few years, I used to have to park on the left side of this bridge right here. This is a photograph of it. The Tableau offices are right to the bottom right in the corner right there. I'd walk across this Fremont Bridge in Seattle, Washington. This is bright blue and orange, uh, what they call double leaf bascule bridge. That means it goes up in the middle, okay? And it was built in 1917, just over 100 years ago. And it sits really close to the water. The clearance, I think, is like 30 feet. So what that means is like every little sailboat has to make it go up and down, as well as larger barges that go between the Puget Sound and, and Lake Union. And so uh, it actually is the most opened drawbridge in the entire United States, average of 35 times a day, which means, which means it wasn't always, always easy to make it to my 9 o'clock meeting, you know what I mean, standing on the left side of that bridge right there. But I always had a good excuse if I was late. What's also interesting about this bridge is that uh, the Seattle Department of Transportation installed two bicycle counters on the bridge, one on the east sidewalk and the other on the west sidewalk to keep track of how many bicycles cross each day. You know, as a city, they're interested in promoting bicycle ridership for environmental reasons and health reasons. So, uh, and what's really cool, again, going back to the theme of open data, is the data from these bridge counters is posted to a city's open data portal that's pretty, again, pretty amazing. And so I was actually presenting at a uh, market researcher's luncheon not far from this exact spot uh, one, one afternoon. And um, I was sort of in a rush, uh, and so didn't have a lot of time to prepare for it. But, but there I was anyway, and, and, and they were all you know, in, in the uh, hotel room eating their meals, and I was up here, and we were talking about it. And I said, well, hey, let's pop open the data from that bridge. I had never looked at it. I was kind of adrenaline junkie like that, you know? I don't know why I do it to myself, but I was like, let's, let's check it out. Let's pop open this data. And we started playing around with it. And we started looking at the bridge bicycle crossings over time. And immediately, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, the yellow one is, is uh, the bridge going one direction, the blue lines are the bridge going the other direction. And it's interesting, right? You see the seasonal trends, sort of like a sine wave, isn't it, right? With, uh, you know, high ridership, as you could imagine, in the summer months and then lower in the winter, but that little spike right there stuck up like a sore thumb. It really did, and you know, we looked at that, and, and I had, again, this is the first time I'd ever laid eyes on it right there in that moment. They just wanted me to show them how to use Tableau, and we were playing around with this one, and, and I said to them, huh, you know, how interesting. So what do you guys think it is? And they were saying things like, you can imagine, oh, maybe it was bike to work day. Maybe there was some kind of a race, and we started noticing, well, wait a minute, there's only the spike on the one side of the bridge, but not the other. And they said, well, maybe the race went in a loop. Maybe the bikes hit an actual spike and popped all the tires. They couldn't get back. I don't know. Lots of really interesting ideas about how we could have been seeing a phenomenon just like this. And, and I didn't know. They didn't know. We moved on. You know, what are we going to do? Well, what's uh, perilous for teachers and presenters in the 21st century is that you all have right now in your pocket a lot more knowledge than me than I'm going to have at any moment in time. So that's a little tricky, but uh, 20 minutes later, the gentleman in the back started you know, waving his phone. I know. I know what happened. I looked it up. I found it. 
And we said, oh, we, tell us, what, what, what happened? What, what was going on? And he said, the counter failed. He found a blog post by the Seattle Bike Blog. There's a blog for everything. Monday appears to smash Fremont Bridge bike counter record. Dash, update, colon, probably not. He went back and forth with the Department of Transportation in Seattle. Turns out that they had four one-hour spikes on those days, all during the 8 or 9 o'clock hour, and only on the east side of the bridge. And it amounted to 1,000 to 2,000 extra counts. Okay, and so they went and they played with the batteries, they messed with the machinery a little bit, and these crazy mysterious spikes went away. By the way, it's interesting to note that they went back and cleaned the data. So if you go back and download that data set right now, you won't see those spikes. So what they did is they replaced it with some kind of average, it looks like, maybe. At the last sentence there, we will adjust the data with errors based on typical volumes and the volumes of surrounding hours. So that's kind of interesting too, isn't it, right? But it, what I think I really want to highlight is the fact that, and it occurred to me in that moment, and I was just as guilty as everyone, I'm including myself in this, not one person, when we were chatting about what could it have been, thought to question the reality of the data. No one, in all the crazy ideas we threw out there about what could cause a spike, none of the suggestions involved the potential that there was no actual mass crossing of bicycles. All of our proposals involved reasons why you would see an actual uh, flux in bicycles, right? Ebola, in that, no, now we're talking about uh, the bridge. That's a, a data set that maybe a bike blogger would look at, but you know, very few others maybe, potentially. Some, I'm sure many will, but, but not a massive scale. Unlike Ebola in West Africa in 2014, when uh, this, this kind of outbreak, you know, this, this uh, pandemic ravaged West Africa, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. And during this crisis, right, this is, we're talking about a global crisis now. So this is no bike counter, this is like the entire world watching as this is happening. And the World Health Organization was providing data about fatalities in weekly situation reports. Here's how many fatalities there are now. Here's how many fatalities there are now, and so on. And they would compile cumulative statistics, how many people have passed away from this disease so far, okay? And you can imagine, if I were to say to you, imagine what a cumulative line would look like every time you'd add to the next, right? Today it's 100. Tomorrow there's five more, so it's 105. Then there's three more, so it's 108. You'd see this climbing line, climbing line, right? Wouldn't you? That's what you'd expect to see. So I downloaded the data, and by the way, these reports were very extensive, and you could also get the raw data. So I did that, I downloaded it, and I put it into Tableau, clicked and dragged and had a great time, and next thing I know, I'm looking at the cumulative death timeline, and I stopped, and I didn't expect to see this at all because I noticed that there were these little notches where the count went down. And, and I thought to myself, you know, what could be causing that? Why would you have a situation where the death count would decline from one day to the next? But you can see that the way, you know, I've worded the question already kind of indicates that I've fallen into that trap. Think of it this way, how can the total number of reported deaths due to this disease decrease from one day to the next? And you can imagine, right, it's perfect sense that the task of diagnosing this disease and ascertaining the causes of death in some of these remote locations, maybe the equipment and staff are uh, severely limited or certainly in, in increasingly difficult situations and circumstances, right? The cause of death of any particular one person isn't always so obvious to these professionals producing these figures. And oftentimes test results may be received later on down the road that would shed light on the uh, situation and perhaps cause them to change their assumptions. And so that would then cause them maybe to correct and to realize that some people that they thought had passed away from Ebola actually had died from some other cause, okay? And actually, the World Health Organization is very thorough and, and these reports would include you know, a table like this, which is categories that they would use to classify potential Ebola cases that it's either suspected or probable or confirmed. So there, and they, and no less than 63 places, they mentioned this fact in the course of just one of the weekly situation reports, right? So again, I just raced through that and just clicked on the download button, and so that's where I would have fallen into a trap that they were very clearly trying to warn me about by their terminology. 
So just going to the raw data without really spending time with the metadata, understanding the fields and what they are, that can be treacherous and that can lead us down this path. But the thing that these all have in common, right, the Ebola uh, situation, the bridge counter, the earthquakes, and the meteorites, what they all four have in common is that there is a gap between your data and reality, okay? And for some reason, you and I and everybody have a little switch in our brain that turns that off and forgets it. And we assume reality and data are one and the same. We start playing with numbers and data and, you know, we just don't pause to remember that they're, to, and to kind of try to flesh out what the difference, what the problems could be, what the inaccuracies could be, right? Based on collection, based on the storage method, even based on really difficult things to ascertain, like the biases or agendas of the people involved with collecting and promulgating or saving the data, right? Or even our own biases in looking at the data. And so we end up with these gaps. And you may say, well, that kind of sounds great, you know, but at the same time, sometimes things are, come on, Ben, sometimes things are, are sure, right? Like, let's take a, what should be a simple example, uh, baseball. So uh, when I was a kid growing up, you know, there was this mythical uh, historical baseball uh, player named Hank Aaron. And he hit 755 home runs. If you look at the back of his baseball card or in Cooperstown, 755. That was a number that stood for a long time. And you might say, okay, you're gonna get all technical and say it's reported home runs, like as if someone like didn't count when he hit one of them, or as if, you know, I don't know, it was sort of, but it wasn't sort of. I mean, there's no, there's no lack of clarity there, right? Either he hit a home run or he didn't. But then I would say to you, well, oh, did you know that when you collect career and report career statistics for a lot of actual professional uh, sports leagues that it doesn't include, for example, the six home runs he hit in the playoffs, including this one in the World Series, it doesn't include the two home runs he hit as a professional in an all-star game. And, of course, it does not, also does not include the five home runs he hit for the Indianapolis Clowns of the, uh, the Negro Leagues before he even joined the Major League. So those are all professional situations. So, you know, th that number should be 768. I mean, how do we look at that, right? I'm not going to get into the, the discussion about whether it would have been a home run in a different park versus the one he was in. You know, not every park in baseball, as you know, is shaped the same. Sometimes the distance to the wall is much shorter or longer than in another place. So these are technicalities, but they're actually real. They have a real impact. And again, there's this, this issue where we're reporting something or looking at a number, but is it what we think it is? Is it, is it different? There's all these, these details about it, and there's all these potentials uh, to, to uh, mislead ourselves or others you know, in perfectly innocent ways, let alone nefarious ways. That's the first error, you know, so again, epistemic errors, we just tend to uh, forget the fact that there's a gap between our data and our reality. By the way, visualization tends to be a great way to help alert us to some of those, like the big spike on the bridge, right? What did that lead us to? It led us to question what's going on there. It led us to question what would cause that. By the way, the data didn't have the answer to that, did it? It was 20 minutes later when someone read a blog. He had to go away from the data to find the answer. And that's a whole side note, but I do think that I hear a lot in this industry, the best thing a data can do is help you answer a question. And I don't believe that to be true. Sure, it gives you a lot of answers, but I think the best thing it can do is help you ask a different question you did not have before, and a lot of the time, you gotta step away from the data and go find out what's happening to get your answer. Go talk to someone, go watch something happening in the real world. Act, uh, like uh, Guy Kawasaki says, you know, think digital, act analog. Let's move on. Technical traps are how we process data. We bring data sets together, we blend them, we join them, we can go on on that. But I'm just gonna talk about some simple, simple examples here of how technically things can get fouled up for us. I like this quote by Usain Bolt, all I have to do is work on transition and technique. And that's very true of working with data too. You know, understanding how we transition uh, is, is super important. So for this little section here, this is a funny section for me, we're gonna take a look at Baltimore towing data. So the city of Baltimore, captures and records towing data uh, to two different tow yards in the Baltimore area. And uh, that amounts to, since um, I believe the year was 2001 to 2015, 61,316 tows. Okay, that's how many times we have records there of, of a car or truck or vehicle of some kind being towed to one of these two yards. 
Oh, no, actually, it's not 2001. It's, it was uh, October 23rd, 2010. Just look at my notes here. It's yesterday, uh, eight years ago, up into 2017, okay? So we can go to the open data portal of the city of Baltimore. We can search for it. We can find it. Here's what it looks like. Over 60,000 tow records for f over five years. And that's just the, the top of it, right? Just giving a little sample of it. And it, again, you know, as we know, right, it's hard for humans to make much sense out of these uh, out of data in this, in this fashion. But I started to say, well, I'm going to play around with this data. I'm going to ask a few questions. I'm going to ask a few questions. First question I have, you know, uh, I'm thinking to myself, I'm guessing a lot of maybe old cars get towed. I don't know. They break down more than new cars, right? So we got, we got uh, new cars, we got old cars. Uh, and so I want to know, you know, which, which, which are they? What, what's the average um, year of a car and truck? Average vehicle year. And it turns out that if I take the average of the column for vehicle year, I get the number 22.65. 22.65. And I'm going to myself, what? Is it 1922? I don't even, there weren't even that many cars, let alone on the road now. What does it even mean? Surely it's not 2022. I hope not. Otherwise, I'm in a bad movie. 22.65. What does that even mean? I'm like, what? If I plot that data, here's what I see. Look closely. On the left-hand side, I see numbers from 0 to 17. All the way on the right-hand side, I see a second group of numbers between 82 and 99. Clearly, they did not get the Y2K memo. I can correct this data by adding what? To the left-hand side group, I can add what? 2,000. Okay? To the right-hand side group, I can add what? 1,900. And if I do that, I correct the data. I'm transforming it now, right? I'm in a situation where I'm, I'm moving it around, and, and that's what I get. Oh, that looks a little better, doesn't it? That's my corrected histogram of vehicle years. And you say, awesome, but then, Ben, why is it all the way to the right? Why is it scrunched on there to the right? And that's because you can't see them, but there are tiny little, outli or, uh, tiny little outliers to the left. They're so small, you can't see them. So I'll point them out to you. There's a Toyota Camry which happens to be vehicle year 20. And when I corrected the data, that added 1900, according to my rule. But they didn't have Camrays or Camrys in 1920, so that's probably some kind of an error. Mysteriously, a Volvo S40 has a vehicle year 40. I'm going, I think I might have known what went wrong there. But I have no idea why the Jeep Liberty has an original vehicle year of 60, because there was no Liberties in 1960. But it is possible that the Cadillac Sedan DeVille uh, that has a, a vehicle year of 63 was, in fact, a 1963 automobile. But as you can say, there's some unknowns there, right? I have to decide what to do with those, those uh, particular, particular data points. So now if I take the average year, it's 2004.8. Uh, okay? That's the average year of the cars and trucks that got towed. So that, I would say, is much better. All right, now if I ask the next question, what about the makes? What kinds of cars, you know, uh, what, and vehicles? What kinds of cars are they uh, that are getting towed? Lots of cars getting towed. Which ones? Well, if I look at the most common makes that got towed, number one, Honda, number two, Ford, number three, Chevy, number four, Toyota, number five, Dodge, Nissan, Toyota, Honda, Acura, Ford, uh-oh. I got some dirty data here, right? Clearly, I have a situation where you can see Toyota and Toyota, Ford and Ford, and it's simply a, si a situation where one's capitalized and one's not. But there's actually 899 makes in this list. See that scroll bar to the top right up there? You can scroll down a long way. So you, if you do, like I did, it's fun. You'll see this Ford and Ford. We saw that already. You'll also see Forf and Ford. Okay, you'll see Peterbilt, you'll see Peter Belt, you'll see Peter Butt, you'll see Pete. I don't know if they towed Pete, I'm guessing that that's Peterbilt. You'll see Mitsubishi and Mitsubishi. She? These are real very these are real values I'm pulling out of the data here, right? And this one's my favorite. You'll see burnt car. We don't know what it was. It's burnt. You'll see 39 ways to sell, spell the word Volkswagen. 
sized by the occurrence there. That's a lot of ways to spell Volkswagen. So we can, thanks to, you know, some of these awesome prep tools. Actually, for this one, I'm so derelict in finishing this book that I had to use Open Refine because it was before Tableau Prep was launched. But I did that. I put it through that. I cleaned it all up. And I say, I got my left-hand side, the original make count. The right-hand side's the new make count. And you might say, what's the big deal? Honda's still at the top and Ford's still number two. True, but Honda right there is 5,200, right? Remember, out of 61,000, probably somewhere around 7 or 8% or something like that. On the right-hand side, now there's 7,700 Hondas. You know, that's a full 50% more. I would have been quite off if I wanted to understand how many. And then also, you know, as we can see, Toyota leapfrogged Chevrolet to take on the number three spot, right? And our friend Volkswagen goes from number 26 all the way up to number 11. It's almost in the top 10 because there were so many different ways that it was misspelled. It got, it more than doubled in count. All right. I want to play act another scenario here. Let's, let's, let's pretend in the same data. Remember, I talked about there being, you know, these tow yards now. I'm going to pretend uh, I work at an auto body shop that's across the street from the tow yard. And, my, uh, my, and I'm in supply chain. Uh, I like to order paint and supplies and things. That's what I do. And my boss, who uh, owns the yard, uh, has been really training us on data lately and you know, going to these awesome conferences and things and coming back saying, we've got to be real data driven now. Okay? So he says to me, all right, Ben, you know, we're going to now reach out to the owners of the cars at these lots, and we're going to let them know. We're going to leave flyers and things like that and give them to the tow yard so they can uh, offer this paint deal, you know, to the, to the people that got their toes probably dinged up. Who knows, right? Um, it's not exactly friendly to paint to get towed, so maybe we can generate some business that way. But I want to make sure we have the right amount of paint. So my, my boss, Vince, Benny Baby, looking into ordering gray paint for upcoming promotion to the owners of the cars, taken from the Belaski tow yard right across the street over there, Ben. We talked about being more data-driven going forward as an organization, so use data to figure out what percentage of the resupply order should be gray. Don't just go by instinct, my man. Show me the data. Bada bing, Vince. I'm like, okay, this guy's a cartoon, first of all. Bosses are often, aren't they? Aren't they? That's another story. I'm like, I'm getting the data. I got it, Vince. I got it. I go to that data. I got it. 61,000 rows. Gray. 3.4%. Got it. Hey, Mr. Abel, I got right on your request today. I analyzed the color data from historical tow records available on the Baltimore Open Data Portal. The numbers are saying, not me, the numbers are saying that 3.4% of the tow vehicles were gray. I'm super confident in this since I've used something called data science to answer the question. I sure am glad we're going all out with data this year because I would have guessed the percentage of gray cars would have been much higher based on, you know, kind of my instinct, what I would recall. But I remember instinct is bad. So, I, but then I thought I sent it, you know, long live data, Ben, boom, send. But I'm sitting there going, it just doesn't feel right. It does, I'm 3.4% and I'm doing the math in my head that's like, you know, what? It's, it's, that's less than 1 in 20? No way. So I go back again and look and I see that there's also one called gray, G-R-A-Y. 5.5%. Well, I'm about to draft this email back to him telling him I was wrong and that it's 8.9%. Sorry. And I stop. And before I hit send, I go, I still don't feel good about this. 8.9%. Because I look a little deeper and I notice that 28.5% of the data is no. There's no paint color recorded for one reason or another. The, the row is blank. Okay? 28.5%. And I think to myself, shoot, what do I do with that? Do I just ignore them? Do I, I don't even know what, clearly 8.9% is, now I'm not so sure about that. But, and this is true about this data, I get really lucky because my Pulaski tow yard, the one that's across from my store, actually has very few of those nulls. Almost all of them come from the other one across, the, the, across town. Literally 99% of the nulls, and this is true in the data, you can go download it and look, it's, it's almost all in one of the yards. The other yard was for some reason religious about recording a color, okay? So I can pretty much just filter it out. And now I'm talking about 12.4% are gray or gray. I, I combined them into one word gray, G-R-A-Y, including G-R-E-Y. In fact, I kind of get worried because there's just those two colors, and I'm like, well, what else is there? Because you see the bottom right, all those tiny little squares? There's a lot of other colors down there. So I spend time, I throw it into Tableau Prep, okay? Then I see, okay, gray. Well, this is called 50 shades of gray, 50 spellings of gray. I've got Gray, I've got Gray, I got Greddy, I got Gray you, I got Gray Y, I got Gary. Gary's up there, second from the top. But when I do all that cleaning and munching around, I, it only goes from 
12.4 up to 12.54, so I'm feeling pretty good. You know, one in eight of the cars are going to be gray, so now I can really focus on, on that for my paint. But I stop and say, well, hold on. I remember this data is over five years now, right? Maybe I should take a look at how this is changing over time. And I put my gray stuff on the bottom. I'm going to say silver is something different for now, but that's another question. But for now, gray is in the bottom. And I notice that it goes from about 11% back in, uh, in the first time the data was collected. You know, now it's up to like 15%. So maybe I should think about that and a trend line going up. So that's another analytical uh, concern to think about. But the point is, right, so we need to be careful about those kinds of things and just jump into conclusions, dragging and dropping and running with a number is something that can get us into trouble. And like I said, this happened to me just last week. I was training at USC a health data fellowship, and we were looking at um, infectious diseases in the state of California, so also known as dirty data. I got one person got it, one person got it. I'm looking at infectious diseases in the state of California back to 2001 to 2015, okay? And there's 15 million recorded uh, instances of this effect, infectious disease from my initial analysis. I can get that data from, by the way, the California Health and Human Services Open Data Portal. Beautiful, again, like, you know, amazing, awesome open data. And uh, here we go. We're looking at, you know, this is not pleasant data, right? We're talking about 15 million, including over half of it uh, for chlamydia up there. But then I was like, and this one actually I knew. I knew this, so I was clever, right? And, and this is the part where I was setting them up a little bit, like I've been doing with you guys all day. I'm going to set them up and say, hey, look at that. What do you think, journalists? Wow. And I say, hey, why don't we analyze this by gender? Let's do that. So when we do that, we drag gender out onto color, and we say, hold on, time out. What do we got up there? Female, male in total? What's going on? So actually, I should filter out total, shouldn't I? It shouldn't be up there at all. So when I take that out, I can see I don't have 8 million cases of chlamydia. It's down to 4.3, which is true for every single disease in the whole data set. It was double counted because it had male, female, and another row for total, where male and female were added up. So I was wrong. It wasn't 15 million instances of infectious diseases. Nope, it was smaller number, smaller germ, 7.4 million up there. And then I was like saying to them, you know, see, you should really be careful, shouldn't you, blah, blah, blah. And then later on, we're going on throughout the course of the day, and we wanted to look at it by county. So we start visualizing diseases and counties, and there's this little thing in the bottom right called one unknown. And I'm taking a look at that going, that's interesting. And I click on that, and look at the top up there. What's the county that's unknown? It's called California. There's no California county in California. There's Alameda County and Alpine County and Amador County and Butte County, but there's no California county. And this was the one that I stopped dead in my tracks right then and there. Because the very thing I set them up to fail happened to me too. California County is just summing up all the other counties. So you got one set of rows that's a total sum, right? So it wasn't just double counting. It was quadruple counting. 3.7 million infectious diseases, right? I got caught in my own trap while I was trying to teach them about a trap. Mathematical miscues, number three, how we calculate data. So I'm going to show you a really dumb slide to show someone who's about to get on an airplane. <laughs> so it turns out that, you know, uh, airplanes hit birds. We know that. Wildlife, too. All kinds of wildlife you'd be blown away if you saw. Because actually, the uh, pilots can voluntarily report this to the, uh, to the F FDA. Uh, sorry, the... Uh, the aviation, FAA, the FAA, they can, they can call up and say, hey, I think it's voluntary, so they can say, hey, I, you know, here's what I hit. It's really weird when you look at the data, they can, they're hitting like, you know, horned toads. I mean, they know like the exact species, it's really wild. It's not just a bird, it's like exactly the kind of bird, and I, I didn't even know existed. I'd be looking up in an encyclopedia, but I was down in San Francisco with, actually, at San Francisco, Palo Alto High School. Brilliant kids, and then I went across the street that same day to the Stanford MBA program, and talk to them as well. We looked at the same data set. I thought that I kind of got a kick out of that, showing the high schoolers the same thing. But we were looking at, uh, and actually, so this, uh, over the course of a week, I was on a little tour visiting some schools, visual, visualizing wildlife strikes data. And this is one we looked at a lot. I would actually just kind of, it was fun. I would just, if you ever want to teach someone, I just said, hey, what questions do you have about, you know, these kinds of data? And I wouldn't say, do this, then do that, first do this, step one. I would just be like, what do you want to know? And one of the students said, well, I'd like to know what time of the day 
uh, while left gets hit. And it looks like this. So you can see, you know, in the early morning, 1, 2, 3 a.m., we're not seeing a whole lot of bird strikes there. It's like in the, you know, morning. And obviously this is counts, this is not rates. So clearly there are more flights coming out of 7 a.m., 8 a.m., right? And then also in the afternoon hours. But I showed this to four different groups before I noticed it. Do you notice it? What's missing? It was on my fourth group that I said, oh my gosh, I didn't even notice it. What's that? 12 o'clock is not there. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13. There's actually zero instances of a single wildlife strike being recorded in the lunchtime hour. Voluntary reporting, as I said. I can put that back in there, can't I? Zero. It's really remarkable. Edgar Allan Poe, one of my favorite poets, I wanted to one time visualize how many uh, pieces of uh, literature he wrote. It turns out there are 150 uh, works of, of literature, poems, short stories, essays, from, uh, from the time he started in 1824 until the last year, uh, the year of his death in 1849, of mysterious causes, okay? And so if I asked you a simple question, what were the years that he didn't publish anything? Well, first of all, you'd say, that, prob that question probably caught you a little off guard, right? because you weren't thinking, it wasn't in your mind that there were years that he did not publish anything. And you're looking really hard, aren't you? You're looking really hard. You're having to look up at a really small font up there to notice that it's just 1826, 1828, and 1830, zero. He took a sabbatical evidently, right? So the problem is when we put a blue pill on columns, getting real tactical here, uh, and sorry for that, I'm not quite sure why that's doing that, but uh, I need to go show missing values sometimes. And that's going to allow uh, Tableau to show numbers for which there are zero records. And if you don't do that, you'll fall into the trap of not knowing that there are gaps there. Remember we talked about gaps? There are gaps literally in, in your data and the way you visualize it. There's no gap. And we need to make sure that we put it there. All right, we're just going through a bunch of examples here. Uh, I got another one for you. This is urbanization. So it's a topic that's fascinating. You know, we see more and more of the Earth's uh, population year after year living in, in an urban environment. And so that's tracked pretty closely by the World Bank and others. And so, you know, it turns out that if we take a look at how many people live in cities across the face of the Earth, we can color code each country by the percentage of the population that lives in a city as opposed to a rural environment. And you can notice that the darker purple ones, by the way, this is using a color palette called Viridis. V as in Victor, I-R-I-D-I-S, Viridis. I highly recommend you Google it. There's a really great tutorial by a Zen master named Mike Cisneros on how to put this default color palette into your Tableau preferences folder and allow you to quickly and easily make what's a very effective um, color palette to good use for you and researchers are doing this a lot. I believe actually like our studio now is defaulting to this color palette for continuous, continuous variables being used to, to encode your, your data, okay? Viridus, that's a side point. But the fact of the matter is you can notice that there are some places uh, that have many more people living, uh, uh, higher, higher percentages rather, of the population living in cities and places close to, you know, the Saharan uh, area there of Africa uh, maybe are, are a little lower in percent, but some other areas are darker. You can see Europe is a little, a little uh, scattered through there, right? But then, quick side note, right? My eye, just because of the, the, the various color palette, kind of uh, darts to the, the bright yellow places, right? Like right there, um, Eritrea or St. Martin or Kosovo. And it turns out, though, you, it looks like they're bright yellow, so you think, oh, no one lives in a city. There are no cities in those places, or if there are, no one lives in them. And it's not true. It's just that those are null values, and the default was to put that as a zero. So I need to make sure to filter those out, which I did. So I avoided that pitfall, and that one, that one was fine. But what if I wanted to go you know, a level higher up in aggregation, and maybe say, instead of looking at this at a country level, I want to understand it more at a regional level. So I can see Canada, where I'm from, and the US, uh, look really close together, but you know, they're a little bit off. But let's say I wanted to know, okay, you know, what's the percentage of people living in a city in North America? Well, it turns out that the world, if I were to just drag and drop, I would, I would be well on my way, right? Well on my way. Well, it turns out that World Bank has three countries that it lists in the North American region. I believe it used, puts Mexico in Latin uh, American and Caribbean countries in that region. North America has Bermuda, Canada, and the United States. Bermuda is 100% urban. I guess they are considering the entire 
island to be a city in the way they define things. I've never been there, so I can't argue with it, but it seemed a little odd to me. But Canada's 82.01 and the US is 81.79. So if I drag and drop my way right into data bliss, I got 87.93 is the percentage of people in the North American region that live in a city, right? Wrong. That's not how it works. You can't average rates like that, percentages. Let's look at it another way. If I take, I have their, their population too. World Bank captures that too. So I could take the percentage of people in cities and multiply it by the population to get an estimate, not a, by the way, a, you know, strictly a measured or, um, uh, or you know, value. It's more calculated value or estimation. But I can see that I have about 65,000 people in Bermuda living in a city. 29 million in Canada and 264 million in the US. So then, if I add those up, that gets to me to 81.81%. 294 million out of the 250, 359 million that live in North America live in cities, 81.81%. Not 87%, I was off. And if I look at that another way by plotting the population itself <coughs> on the x-axis and the percent on the y-axis, and sizing it by the overall population, I can see that the US is way over there to the right with a large number of people in cities in a huge circle. And then there's Canada to the left. And Bermuda, you can barely even see way, way, way up there. Right? It's a tiny little dot. I mean, 65,000 people, you know? That's only like four times the number of people at this event and accounting for the entire thing. So what was happening, it was that small, if I weighted them equally, then it was actually pulling the average high. You can see the two lines. One is the incorrect drag and drop mess up with 87.9%, and then there's a correct one where I did the math right, and I got 81.81%. So we have to be careful with that, you know? And you may say, that's so obvious, Ben. I mean, when I show it to you, yeah. But I make these kinds of mistakes all the time. I really do. I need to stop and be careful and look at it more closely. And if I did the same thing for all the regions, I'd see something like this, right? North America, as we know, went down. On the left-hand side is the quote-unquote wrong method. The right-hand side is the right method. Latin America shoots up. North America and, uh, and Middle East and Africa go down, and, and so on, right? So I would have gotten them all quite wrong. Two different methods. This is a quick little one here, statistical slip hops, how we compare data. The average, we got an NFL season going here, right? NFL players. The average NFL player is about 25 years old, 6'2 in height, weighs 244 pounds, and makes $1.5 million in salary per year. And if I take the distributions for each of those four variables and put them on the left, that's what I get. Can you tell which is which? Do you know which is which? A, let's look at A. Sort of, you know, pretty, pretty Gaussian, right? Pretty normal. Which is that? Is it height, age, weight, or salary? I hear weight, I heard height. That's height. Turns out that the height of NFL players is pretty normally distributed. What about B over there on the right? Age, weight, or salary? That's age, right? So what we've got is most players are in a certain region there. And by the way, there's a hard cutoff on the left because you can't get into the league if you're, uh, until you have a certain uh, number of years of, of uh, I think it's, there's an age limit there, right? But on the right-hand side, you do see a very small number of players like the Tom Brady's and such that are kind of hanging in the league. When, but, but for the most part, people you know, in their 30s and uh, 5 and up are not in the league anymore. And which, what about this weird one on the bottom left? What's that? Is that salary? People making different amounts of money, right? No, that's weight, because you got your heavy players, like your people on the line. You get these lighter, you know, speedier players, like wide receivers and such on the left, cornerbacks on the left. It's very positionally dependent. There's groups, right? That's kind of fascinating. It's almost trimodal. And then on the right, D, you've got salary, right? It's by process of elimination. That is, the people are all the way to the right that you can't even see the bar, but they make a lot of money. There's a handful of players, you know, a dozen or so in the league that make, you know, orders of magnitude higher than all the other players. So if you tell your, and 1.5 actually is pretty, is, is not really, is, is way over to the right of that big spike. It really is. You know, the, the most, most players, most in terms of the most typical, make way less than that, uh, than, than half a million. But the, the problem is, again, we have a defect in our brain. Because when I told you the average is there, you said to yourself, that's a pretty typical number, okay? You imagined that you know, most players typically make about $1.5 million in the National Football League, but it wasn't true. Just because it was the arithmetic average or the mean 
doesn't mean that it was actually very typical. In, in this case, in some of these distributions, it was, it was not quite, it was not typical at all. 244 for weight, that's in like the bottom trough right there between the second and third peaks. It's a pretty abnormal weight as of, in, of itself, all right? So a very small percentage of players in the league make, you know, weigh 244. So we don't really remember that though. You know, that's, that's the pitfall is that we, as soon as someone tells us an average, we just hear typical. That's, what, that's the way we interpret that English sentence and probably in other languages too. So we gotta be careful about that. But this is my favorite one, I did a fifth one. It's called the uniform distribution. It goes from zero to 99. And I like calling it the uniform distribution because anybody know what it is? Jersey numbers on the back of the uniform. See, see what I did there? It's a uniform distribution. <laughs> Gotta love the nerdy jokes. Last one, analytical aberrations, how we analyze data. There's this guy, his name is Danny Kahneman. He is brilliant. Has anybody read any of his books? Behavioral Economist, yeah. Thinking fast and slow, write it down, go and get it and read it. Nobel Prize winner in behavioral economics. He and his partner, Amos Tversky, researchers, mostly operating, I believe, out of Israel, constructed some ingenious experiments to test the fallacies and biases and complete mess-ups that our brain does to us when we work with numbers. He uh, has in his book, on this exact uh, book right here, this section right here. The counties in which the incidence of kidney cancer is lowest are mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, the South, and the West. Factual statement, it's absolutely true. And he said to people he re researched, he said, can you help me understand why, what, how would you explain that? And people said things like, oh, you know, well, they live in the country, so they're not around all the pollutants of the city. Or, you know, they eat a you know, healthier diet with less fast food, perhaps. Or, you know, their, their, their water supply might be closer to, right? They come up with all these interesting theories as to why that would be true. And then he says, now consider the counties in which the incidence of kidney cancer is the highest. These ailing counties tend to be mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, the South, and the West. Also true, factual. And then he says, what about that? And they say, if he says that to a different group, they'd say, oh, well, you know, that's because they don't have access to good health care, or right, they'll, they'll go off on these interesting kind of tangents to explain what's going on. But what is going on? How can both of these statements be true? That doesn't seem to make any sense, right? They seem to contradict each other. How can the incidences be highest and lowest in the exact same kinds of counties? Well, I s read the book, and you know, because I'm a data geek, I closed the book, I ran over to my computer, I found kidney cancer rates, and then I also found population for counties, and I made a dashboard out of it. And I noticed pretty quickly, if you look at the map in the top left, that the incidence of kidney cancer is almost like a checkerboard, isn't it? In fact, the darkest orange, which is the highest rates, is in many cases right next door to the darkest blue, which are the lowest rates. So that's interesting, These are, they're right next to each other. And th the answer was, when I looked at the population curve on the bottom there, okay, population from left to right, low population on the left, high population like Cook County, Los Angeles County on the right, and then I plotted that with the incidence rate, high being high incidence rate, low being low incidence rate. I get this funnel shape, don't I? And the incidence rate for the smallest counties kind of it expands out, doesn't it, right? I've got these really high, like um, Pulaski County in Illinois, okay, with incidence rate of 40, 45 per 100,000 people. It has a population of 6,000 with four cases a year. On the low side, I've got Polk County and then there, 44,000 there, only four people in the county had it. We're talking about really small counts here. And that's because as the sample size or population gets smaller, the variance in the mean increases. Only one case or two cases difference, incidents, uh, diagnosed or not diagnosed, would cause one of those little dots on the left to go from the very top to the very bottom or vice versa, right? Small counts, small populations. We don't really, again, really appreciate that. And it occurred to me that if Mr. Kahneman moved to Lost Springs with a population of one, you'd have a 50% chance 50% of the population will be Nobel Prize winners. And if you thought for a minute you could move there and have a 50-50 chance of winning the Nobel Prize, you'd fall into this trap. I got so excited, I sent this to him. You know, he's like a hero of mine, a hero. I said, hey, you don't know me. My name is Ben Jones. I did this thing, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then I got this back. Thanks. That was fun. 
DK. You know, me and DK. You know, me and DK go way back. No, we do not. A few minutes left here. I, I was ecstatic when I got this. You don't even know. I, put my, I ran around the room. I mean, this guy is like a real, he's a hero to me. I think I, you know, I wrote like a five-paragraph response, and then that, I didn't get anything back after that. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do about all this? Are we talking about, oh, it's like so depressing. There's so many ways we can fall into these data pitfalls. Well, I say, hey, put this on your cubicle wall or wherever your desk is. Keep calm and don't rush me. Because the fact is, there's no shortcut to this stuff here. We've got to be able to take time with data. And yeah, take a picture of it and give it to your boss. Don't rush me. You have to spend time with the data. The more time you spend with it, the more weird things you see, the more re ways you realize you would have been tripped up. I like to think of it like a friend of mine, Michael Mixon, who's one of the Zen masters here at the conference. He, he said it to me, uh, this phrase to me that was beautiful. Explore the contours of your data. Right? It's like an island, and you've got to go all the way around it. You're an explorer. You've got to get all the nooks and crannies and the funny little places you didn't even know were there. And you, have to sp you, you, can't, you can't just do that quickly. Don't let any, any company tell you otherwise. I mean, this is a process. You need to be able to, as I like to say, spend some good quality time with your data. You've got to know it. You've got to dive into it. And, and one other way I think about it you know, is that I like to hike and backpack, and so you've got your map. You've got to be able to get your map, but there's nothing that uh, replaces actually getting out on the trail and walking it and seeing it for yourself, right? And looking around, going through it step by step, uh, like I had the chance to do this last summer in a place called the Enchantments in the Central Cascades of Washington. Beautiful territory. And, you know, knowing the map, that's great. Well, for, the me, for me, the map is keeping a little tick list by my, by my desk where I check tick off every time I find myself in the bottom of one of those darn pitfalls. And now I have a visual that shows me, you know, how many times that's going to happen to me, and I'm able to do that and keep track of it, and that's important. All right, so I'd like to conclude with one last slide and say thanks. That was fun, BJ. If you could please do me a favor and leave me some comments. I can, you can ma actually make me make this book even better by putting your thoughts into this, uh, this uh, app here. And so I want to thank you for your time here. Enjoy the rest. I think we're pretty much, almost probably done, right? Maybe one, one or two more things. So thank you for coming to the conference here in New Orleans. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much.